Showdown with Saddam, the deadline for war. Commando missions set up inside Iraq as huge force prepares to invade on a moment's notice. Marine helicopters conduct their final practice flights. Next time, it's the real thing. With war coming, Iraqis board up their homes and get out of Baghdad. And once the new war begins, the U.S. will try to find an airman missing from the last Gulf War, a man once given up for dead. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather reporting from CBS News headquarters in New York. Good evening. He said he wouldn't. There's no indication he did. No indication Saddam Hussein left Iraq tonight, the deadline for avoiding a U.S. invasion. An invasion that could come as soon as tonight, in a matter of hours or in a few days. As the 8 p.m. deadline approached, President Bush met with his war council and notified Congress of his intention to attack Iraq. The White House said Americans should prepare for what's hoped to be a short conflict, but also should be prepared for loss of life. U.S. warplanes shot at artillery and dropped warning leaflets on Iraq as U.S. troops moved to forward positions. A contingent of CBS News correspondents is also in position to bring you this critically important story. We begin tonight with the latest on the war plan, and we get that from David Martin at the Pentagon. David? Dan, as the hours tick down toward the start of the war, the U.S. is sending increasing numbers of special operations teams into Iraq to pave the way for the invasion. War is imminent, and everybody knows it. The soldiers and Marines moving to their attack points in northern Kuwait. The air crews who today attacked Iraqi missile and artillery batteries that threaten American troops now that they have moved so close to the border. And the sailors aboard the carrier Lincoln who listened to a pep talk from the commander of naval forces. But I think it very likely that within a couple of days, jets are going to be going off the front end of Abraham Lincoln. Today, the U.S. dropped a record two million leaflets over southern Iraq, warning Iraqi soldiers to lay down their arms and go home. 17 Iraqis walked across the border into Kuwait and surrendered. The first in what is expected to be a flood tide of Iraqi soldiers who come out with their hands up once the shooting starts. One, two, three. The air campaign has been designed to convince the Iraqis they don't stand a chance. The effects that we are trying to create is to make it so apparent and so overwhelming at the very outset of potential military operations that the adversary quickly realizes that, that there is no real alternative here other than to, to fight and die or to give up. The Air Force has already showcased the 21,000-pound so-called mother of all bombs, and today the Pentagon talked about another weapon that will be used for the first time, this one able to destroy multiple tanks at the same time. The military also made clear that in this war, American planes will have a much easier time dominating the skies because after 12 years of knocking out missile sites in the no-fly zones, there aren't many air defenses left. It is a significantly less hostile place than it was in northern and southern Iraq on the opening night of the Gulf War. A row of what appears to be American special operations helicopters was spotted sitting across the border in Jordan, but they won't be sitting there much longer. Weather could cause a delay or the Iraqis could start shooting first, but if everything remains on schedule, we are now 24 to 48 hours away from the start of the final battle with Saddam Hussein. Dan? David Martin reporting live from the Pentagon. Now let's touch base with CBS News correspondents who are with U.S. forces just south of the Iraq-Kuwait border. Byron Pitts is with the U.S. Marine Corps attack helicopter unit called the Vipers. Their camp now so close to the Iraqi border, no lights are allowed. Byron's report was taped using a special night scope lens. Dan, tonight the mood here is as dark as the desert skyline. U.S. and British forces now have the sense the time for war is near. Here at the secret U.S. air base where I'm positioned, all the practice runs are over. U.S. and British forces are massing at the Iraqi border by the tens of thousands. The Army, Marines, Navy SEALs, all on high alert hidden under the cover of darkness. One can only see through a night vision lens. Technology believed to be in short supply in the Iraqi army. Tonight, for the first time here, all of these Marine Super Attack Cobra helicopters sit on the runway, fully loaded with live ammunition. So you feeling good about the preparation? Absolutely. I mean, I, we're ready. 
This is the commanding officer of Light Attack Helicopter Squadron 169 from Camp Pendleton, California. For security reasons, we cannot give his name. We're pros. I mean, this, this is what we do, and, and we're just tremendous at it. Still concerned Saddam may use chemical weapons. All troops are now under orders to keep their gas masks at their side and their chem suits nearby. When the war steps off, the chem suits go on. This is video okay, obtained exclusively by CBS News. It's the last practice run of Marine Cobra helicopters using live missiles. The pilots fire four tow missiles. All four hit the target. There you go. Good, good. Good hit, good hit. Two good hits. The commanding officer of this squadron has told his Marines to get ready. I don't know when the fight will start, he says, but quote, it will be violent it will be rapid, and we will overwhelm them. With the U.S. Marine Viper Squadron, Byron Pitts, CBS News. CBS News correspondent Jim Axelrod is with one of the U.S. Army's heavy armor units, the 3rd Infantry Division. Jim's report was also taped in darkness with a night scope lens. These are some of the 10,000 vehicles of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division, tanks, Humvees, trucks, that have now been repositioned to within miles of the Iraqi border, although we can't report exactly where. The troops at this position, the 3rd Infantry Division's 1st Brigade Combat Team, have now been given ammunition, small arms, tank rounds, explosives. They are wearing their Kevlar and their helmets, although the troops here, at least, are not in chem suits as they make their final preparations for war. It is quiet tonight, very dark, troops asleep on cots right next to their vehicles. Talked to one major today who told me when he spoke to his troops, he said it's okay to be scared. Fear is not a bad thing as long as it doesn't break a soldier's focus. This could well be the last quiet night for the troops of the 1st Brigade Combat Team, and that's because they could well be among the first ground troops into Iraq if the president gives the order to invade. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, with the 3rd Infantry in Kuwait. Another frontline U.S. Army unit poised in Kuwait and expected to be in the thick of the coming fight is the 101st Airborne Division. CBS's Mark Strassman is with the 101st and joins us now by video phone. Dan, for this brigade, this was another day of refining plans for several combat missions. Also here today, the commanding general of the entire 101st Airborne Division was here being briefed on those plans. So there's an edge here tonight, an expectant air among troops, and their commanders. At Camp Pennsylvania, the pace keeps quickening. Any day now, troops here expect to move north toward the Iraqi border. This was practice for combat, positioning a 105 howitzer within six minutes. Artillery sections here believe their time for camp rehearsals is almost over. Mainly now, sir, we basically train as we fight, getting used to different types of terrain, and also uh, working with all the equipment. More of that equipment arrived here today, part of the American military's massing of forces for war. For the U.S. military, one of the big worries all along has been that the Iraqis would set fire to their oil fields. Tonight, commanders here shared this intelligence. In the last week, civilian technicians were spotted in the Ramallah oil fields of southern Iraq. It's believed they were setting explosives. Dan? Mark, what kind of targets will the 101st be after? Dan, this is a rapid air assault force. They can pretty much strike anywhere at any time. An important bridge, a suspected chemical weapons site, even strategic points inside Baghdad. It's an airborne capability that's unmatched by any other military in the world. Dan? Mark Rushman with the 101st Airborne in Kuwait. Thanks. About 300 miles northwest of where U.S. forces are assembled, the people of Baghdad are spending what must be a difficult and unsettling night, perhaps their last night before war begins. This is the live picture of Baghdad tonight, eerily quiet this evening. One of the very few Western reporters still in the Iraqi capital is David Chater of CBS-affiliated Sky News in Britain. A short time ago, I asked him by telephone what the situation is there. And I've never known this city so quiet. It's like everybody here is holding their breath, looking upwards, looking southwards, expecting the attack to come any minute now. The whole of the city is still lit very brightly, 
but nobody's moving on the streets whatsoever. The only people I have seen are army units with steel helmets and Kalashnikov assault rifles taking up position at every strategic corner of the city in sandbank position. But there are many forces we don't see. There are many forces like the Republican Guard that are deployed inside a dense, dense urban area. We've seen trenches being dug all around the city, trenches filled with oil. David, who is left in the capital of Iraq now? Very few people have been able to get out. There have been very long uh, queues at petrol stations. Essentially, this is a capital city that's uh, used to war. But many people have got bomb shelters. They've taken to those bomb shelters in their back garden. Uh, there are many civilian, uh, large civilian bomb shelters, but uh, many people don't want to go in those. They all remember the casualties from the last Gulf War. They'd rather make it on their own, go in their own back gardens with their own children and fend for themselves. It's been a very difficult time. They talk about the 12 years of sanctions. They talk about so many children who died because of the, uh, the regime of sanctions imposed by the United Nations. And I think perhaps what they'd like to say is that uh, maybe the casualties that will come this time will be the end of the end of their suffering. At least they can see perhaps some light at the end of the tunnel. David, you mentioned that there are trenches dug with oil in the trenches. To what purpose are those oil-filled facilities? It's very clear what they will do as soon as they see the, the opening at the start of the aerial campaign. Uh, they're going to set light to those uh, oil-filled trenches. I've seen them everywhere. I've seen them coming back from Tikrit. And the phone went dead at that point. For what reason, we do not know. That was David Chater in Baghdad. President Bush mostly stayed out of public view this day, preparing for the new war with Iraq. CBS's Bill Plant has that part of the story from the White House. Members of the president's war policy group made two trips to the White House today to review their planning hours before the deadline for Saddam Hussein's departure, which the White House clearly never expected. Tonight, the American people will know if Saddam Hussein has committed his final act of defiance. The president has urged Saddam Hussein to leave the country so that military conflict can be avoided. We have no indications that he has chosen to do that, unfortunately. Mr. Bush, who has had no public events and few meetings in recent days, did sit down today with New York's mayor, who wants more money for homeland security. And as Mr. Bush sent Congress the formal notification required by law to justify the use of military force, the president's decision to abandon diplomacy for war was denounced in the UN Security Council. Peaceful means have therefore not been exhausted. Also for that reason, Germany emphatically rejects the impending war. The U.S. decided it didn't need the U.N. to go to war, but it does want the U.N. to help with the peace. And the same nations who bitterly oppose the war are now trying to hold the U.N. together. When time will come to rebuild Iraq, we want the United Nations to be the key player because it is the only one who can make, accept, and who can uh, minimize uh, the difficulty, very important difficulty that we may face. Without hinting when the war will begin, the White House has started to warn that it may not be short or easy. And also one more thing which has barely been mentioned that it's time to prepare for the fact that American lives will be lost. Dan? Bill Plant reporting live from the White House. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, he was shot down in the first Thanks. Gulf War. Now there's new hope an American airman might still be alive. <laughs> One mission for U.S. forces heading into Iraq is really a long-delayed effort to complete a mission begun more than 12 years ago to find the U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Scott Spiker. CBS News has been following his improbable story for years now, and his correspondent Wyatt Andrews reports tonight, a new chapter and perhaps an unlikely conclusion is about to unfold. Hello, Jacksonville. I'm Scott Spiker of VF-81. You may never have heard of Navy Captain Scott Spiker, but finding him is one of the quiet missions of the coming war. Twelve years ago, then-Lieutenant Commander Spiker flew the first airstrike of the first Gulf War. He was shot down, declared dead, and given a tomb in Arlington. Then, the CBS broadcast 60 Minutes 2 reported on growing evidence he was alive, that he may have ejected safely, and according to an Iraqi defector, was driven from the desert to Baghdad. 
That defector even picked Spiker from a photo lineup. So the Pentagon changed Spiker's status. He's now thought to be a POW, the only American prisoner from the 91 war. We are pursuing it as if uh, Captain Scott Spiker is alive and uh, being held by the Iraqis. I believe he's alive. Today, well known, Senator uh, Bill Nelson of the Senate Armed Services Committee told CBS location. News the military has fresh information on Spiker it hopes but does not know is accurate and that U.S. forces will attempt to find him. I believe that our commanders have as one of the top of their priority items to go and look for Scott Spiker. A rescue mission. Clearly on their list of things to do is going to be to look for Scott. In Jacksonville, Spiker's hometown, the search is personal. John Kern, a former shipmate of Spiker's, is now a middle school teacher. His class of sixth graders has written letters demanding Spiker's return. I had one student actually write the Iraqi embassy. They want Scott Spiker's release. They want to see him come home. To the military, this is also personal. There's a man out there left behind. Scott Spiker flew the first mission of the first Gulf War. Saving his life is the unpaid debt of this one. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, Washington. The U.S. military in South Korea today ordered extra security for American troops there, including a new curfew starting tomorrow. All 37,000 U.S. soldiers in South Korea must be off the streets by 7.30 p.m. to protect them from what the military calls, quote, anybody that might want to use the world situation to their benefit, unquote. Next year on the CBS Evening News, Olympic athletes and the savagery of Saddam's son. You will see how far the Husseins will go to get their way. As events unfold overseas, CBS News has been told they affect us here at home. Comprehensive. Up to the minute. In-depth reporting. Experience the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather. When President Bush set tonight's deadline for Saddam Hussein to be out of Iraq or face war, the president included Saddam's sons, two of whom hold important positions in the Iraqi regime. Qusay Saddam Hussein is head of the elite Republican Guard and of the Iraqi Intelligence and Security Service. Uday Saddam Hussein, the eldest son with a special reputation for ruthlessness, controls the Iraqi state media. But Uday was given another position as well, head of the Iraqi Olympic program. And as CBS's Sandra Hughes reports, that was bad news for the athletes. These former elite Iraqi athletes once prayed for Olympic glory. But it was a quest that turned into torture. Before escaping Iraq after the first Gulf War, they trained to win under Saddam Hussein's son, Uday, head of Iraq's Olympic program. Champion volleyball player Isam Al Dewan says losing brought the ultimate threat. We receive calls from Uday. If you lose the game, that's mean nobody come to Iraq or will kill you and will execute all your family inside Iraq. Isam says he was jailed and tortured. While athletic victories were celebrated in the streets of Baghdad, he claims other players were beaten, had their children burned with acid or just disappeared. Ibrahim Alwan was on Uday's hand-picked soccer team. When he missed a practice... They put me in the jail. I get in the jail seven days. This national wrestling hero, Najim Ali Kabi, took part in a political march and was shot by Iraqi police. Soldier Saddam has shot me in my back and, uh, and there's a hole in the side in my chest. After documenting the abuses, a London human rights organization sent this formal complaint to the International Olympic Committee, asking it to expel Iraq from competition. The IOC is investigating, but tells CBS News its findings so far are confidential. In the headquarters of the Iraqi National Olympic Committee, there's a prison and a torture chamber. And we believe that hundreds of athletes have been tortured and as many as 50 athletes have been killed. Isam now runs the Iraqi Olympic Council, a group opposed to Iraq's government. Saddam Hussein, he is war criminals. We welcome the war who saved us from Saddam Hussein. But for now, they wait and watch, remembering how yeah. their dreams of Olympic Jesus, glory uh, were destroyed. Yeah. Sandra Hughes, CBS News, El Cajon, California.
There'll be more of the CBS Evening News in a moment. Now updating the showdown with Saddam as Saddam Hussein defies tonight's U.S. deadline to leave Iraq. A huge U.S. and British force is now poised just south of the Kuwaiti border in position for attack, which is expected to come within days, if not hours. Some special operations force commandos are already inside Iraq. U.S. aircraft today dropped two million leaflets over southern Iraq, urging Iraqi soldiers to surrender. They also knocked out some artillery positions and a handful of iraqi border guards and troops 17 soldiers of some kind did just that walking across the border into kuwait with the united states of america now on a war footing and under a terror alert one man managed to tie up much of the nation's capital for two days but this bizarre story finally ended today 52 year old dwight watson a farmer unhappy with government tobacco policies stepped out of the tractor that he had driven unnoticed and uncontested into the pond on the National Mall. He finally backed away today and surrendered to the U.S. Park Police. Watson had claimed he had weapons and explosives. Turned out he had neither. Now some CBS stations will be returning to local programming at this point. For others, we'll be right back. This is CBS.